This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis creates 13 new cardinals in an ordinary consistory in far from ordinary times. A Panamanian delegation passes the World Youth Day cross and icon to Portuguese youth in preparation for World Youth Day 2023 in Lisbon, Portugal. Meet Mateia, a young surgeon from Bosnia whose faith was deeply impacted by her experience at World Youth Day. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis has created 13 new cardinals. The consistory took place on Saturday, November the 28th in St. Peter's Basilica, but this consistory was far from ordinary. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pax Vobis. Due to COVID restrictions, two of the newly appointed cardinals were unable to physically attend and sent representatives in their place. Cardinal Cornelius Sim, the Apostolic Vicar of Brunei, and Cardinal Jose Advincula of Capiz in the Philippines followed via live stream from their respective homes. Adding to this historic consistory was the appointment of a cardinal who had not been previously ordained a bishop. Pope Francis waived this formality and appointed Italian Capuchin friar, Father Raniero Cantalamesa, preacher to the pontifical household, as one of the 13 cardinals. Principis Apostolorum, direction in tua in Ecclesia Romanari. Ad honor in Dei Onipotentis, in Santorum Apostolorum Petri Paolo, et tibi commitimus diaconia, Santi Apollinarius, a Termas Neronianis, Alexandrina, in nomine Patris, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Another Franciscan, Fra Mauro Gambetti, the custodian of the sacred convent of Assisi, was ordained a bishop a week ahead of the consistory on Sunday, November the 22nd. Before being made cardinal, he described how he's living the moment. There are turning points in life that sometimes involve taking leaps what I am living, I consider a plunge from a trampoline into open ocean, while I hear myself repeating, Duc in altum, put out into the deep. Duc in altum. After the celebration, the Holy Father and the 11 new cardinals present in Rome visited Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI in the chapel of the Mater Ecclesia Monastery inside the Vatican. The day after, the newly appointed cardinals can celebrate Mass with Pope Francis in St. Peter's Basilica. Each year, dioceses around the world hold their own World Youth Day on Palm Sunday to commemorate St. John Paul II's inaugural celebration in 1986. This year, due to the coronavirus pandemic, it was moved to the November the 26th Solemnity of Christ the King. In his homily for the occasion, the Pope called all young people to follow God's big dream and embrace a life full of service to others. We are not made for dreams of vacations or weekends, but to realize the dreams of God in this way. 
He made us have the capacity to dream, to embrace the beauty of life. And the works of mercy are the most beautiful works of life. Le opere di misericordia sono le opere più belle della vita. This message from Pope Francis ties in directly with his message for World Youth Day in Lisbon, which is taken from the Bible passage where Mary visits Elizabeth. Mary arose and went with haste. After Mass, the Panamanian youth presented the cross and icon to the Portuguese delegation in preparation for the upcoming World Youth Day in 2023. The cross symbolizes Christ's love and promise of salvation. Since the first World Youth Day, the cross has traveled with young people around the world, traveling from parish to parish and diocese to diocese, spreading the message of love and sacrifice. Along with the cross, an icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary accompanies the youth, highlighting Mary's continual presence in Christ's life and the lives of young people around the world. Pope Francis decided to move the diocesan celebration of World Youth Day from Palm Sunday to Christ the King Sunday, beginning in 2021, Pope Francis explained the shift as a means of highlighting what John Paul II, the founder of World Youth Day, always emphasized, the mystery of Christ the Redeemer. Jornada Mundial de la Juventud se tendrá en Portugal. Portuguese young people were thrilled to start World Youth Day preparations, carrying home the World Youth Day symbols. It is a symbolic moment on this journey. We have received the World Youth Day cross and icon, and it is also a concrete moment, tangible, in which we will bring to Portugal the symbols and the youth will be able to see them and go on pilgrimage within the country. Patriarch of Lisbon, Cardinal Manuel Clemente, hopes that the pandemic will finish soon and the World Youth Day symbols will be able to travel from parish to parish to prepare the Portuguese spiritually. However, for the moment, this mission will continue online. The organization of World Youth Day, transmitted through the internet, is in contact with many people around the world. And this possibility that the internet offers us enables movement towards World Youth Day grow more and stronger and also more intense because in this moment those who cannot be present are there in spirit. Portuguese Cardinal and Rome resident José Tolentino Mendonça reminds us what the true essence of World Youth Days is. Uh, the World Youth Days are a sign of what the Church is, and in addition to having a sign is being a sign, and the young people are that to the world, and they are a sign of the strength of love, of the fantasy of charity, of putting oneself in the disposition to help, of words of hope, of gestures of welcome to those who need it. The days ask all young people and the church a great commitment with Christian life and with the world, in the present, in the now. Pope John Paul II instituted World Youth Day in 1985 to enable young people to encounter Christ. Since its beginning, World Youth Day has touched the lives of millions of young people around the world. After the break, we'll meet Matea Leiden from Copenhagen, who experienced a deep faith renewal at the World Youth Day in Germany in 2005. This piece originally aired on EWTN's Catholic Scandinavia. Of 
course it's hard if somebody asks you why did my daughter have to die. I've seen young kids die in drowning accidents and car accidents. I really I think there is a reason with everything. Maybe losing someone will bring the rest of the family closer, maybe without dark you can't appreciate light. Matea Leiden is training to be a heart and lung surgeon here at the Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark. And at only 30 years of age, she is an impressive woman working in a mainly male dominated field. When did you realize you wanted to be a doctor and why? For as long as I can remember, I've been dreaming of being a doctor, which is strange. I think part of it is because we've been raised to have to do meaningful stuff. So, uh, it was a calling because it felt like, for me, like the most meaningful job I could have. But what's even more impressive is the path she has had to take to get to where she is in life. Yugoslavia, 1991. After the fall of communism, a bloody war broke out as the country split into separate states. Fearing for their lives, Matea and her family fled from Bosnia and Herzegovina and they came to Sweden as refugees. In Sweden, they got accommodation in one of the worst neighborhoods in the city of Malmo. We came as refugees. My the, the parents didn't have an education here. They didn't know the language, and uh, you never really felt 100% at home or Swedish. Matea was attending a struggling school in the neighborhood, and the idea of a student from a school like this going on to become a doctor was really unheard of. I went to these, if you can call them ghetto schools. And then to become a doctor, I had to go at a good uh, high school, of course. And so I applied for the best in Malmö. And I remember when I came to an information meeting with my mom, and I said, like my background, where I studied now, where I was from, he said, uh, I don't mean to offend you, but maybe you should go for a nurse or sub-nurse. What did that feel like when they were telling you to your face that this wasn't the high school for you. And I like when people underestimate me. Then I like to prove them wrong. And it makes me a hard worker. And underestimate Matea, they did. Despite her background, she was accepted and enrolled in one of the best high schools in Malmo, where she started to excel in her schoolwork. Matea and her family were Catholic, but it wasn't something they took that seriously. Here you are, Matea, going to the best high school now despite the background you had in the education in primary school. I'm sure you had loads of friends. You had a good life in Sweden, so what was wrong? You didn't really need faith or need God in your life. There wasn't really a problem. That's why I didn't think much about it. I didn't know what my faith was about. I didn't know it. And then it was on a trip to World Youth Day in Germany in 2005 that she discovered the faith. Remember one day when we were sitting in church and everybody was talking and making a lot of noise. And a monk, one of, in the Swedish group said, don't you understand that you're sitting in front of what you're sitting in front of and showing so little respect. And he talked about the tabernacle. And that was the first time I actually understood what it was about. And I really, it's hard to explain, but I knew it. I knew what it was and that it was the truth. Matea sat in front of the tabernacle for some time, taking in what she had just heard from the monk. You say that you realized it was the truth there and then, but what made you realize that? I can understand the monk explaining it to you and you understanding the philosophy and the teachings of the church, but what made you realize it was the actual truth? It was faith. It's hard, it's, I just knew. I understood it, the depth to it. Matea continued to study hard at school, driven by the dream of one day being a doctor. But with her disadvantaged background, she needed to be more than exceptional if her dream was to become a reality. I read almost the, the double amount of uh, courses that she needed to read and got the highest grade in all of them. Got a scholarship in the end for the best grades ever in history of that school. After graduating with straight A's, she went on to study mathematics and physics at Lund University before enrolling in medicine at the University of Copenhagen Hospital, where she now works, her faith giving her strength and meaning in the work that she does. If I have a shift, almost every shift will be to some trauma, 
I'll see a motorcycle accident or a car accident or a... And when you see these horrific scenes in front of you, is there a part of you that questions God or wonders why, if there is this God, would he do this to people? I think you can't appreciate the, the good if you don't, haven't experienced the bad. And everything happens for a reason. It makes you stronger. Sometimes it's hard to understand the reason, but there is behind. And, but it's, of course it's hard if somebody asks you, why did my daughter have to die? I've seen young kids die in drowning accidents and car accidents. Of course it's hard to explain, especially for someone who doesn't believe. I really, I think there is a reason with everything. Maybe losing someone will bring the rest of the family closer, maybe. Without dark, you can't appreciate light. As long as I just do my best, what happens is not in my hands. I owe everything, I think, to my faith. After the break, we're going to bring you a story about the traveling statue of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal. Stay with us. On the occasion of the 190th anniversary of the Marian apparitions to St. Catherine Labouré, a novice of the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, the congregation organized a pilgrimage with the sacred statue of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal through Italy. Our Lady appeared to St. Catherine three times in 1830 in Rue de Bac Street in Paris. In the apparitions, she asked that the Miraculous Medal be made and promised that all who wear the medal will receive great graces. This year, on November the 11th, the Feast of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal, in the presence of a small delegation and the Superior General of the Congregation of the Mission, Father Tomasz Mavrich, the Holy Father blessed the statue as it began the pilgrimage. The Miraculous Medal, as, as uh, it is called, uh, Miraculous, uh, and uh, the name did not happen uh, by a person who decided to start calling it like that, or, or even uh, Mary asking uh, uh, Catherine Labouré to call it that way, but the people, in fact, the people uh, that um, after hearing the message of Mary, of Jesus through Mary to Catherine, to, uh, to come to the, uh, to the, uh, to the altar, to, to ask for graces with faith, with hope, uh, with trust, and ask for graces uh, that you need. And if you're going to be open and uh, you, have, uh, you will have faith, you will receive them. And that's how miracles started to happen, by people carrying the medal around their neck, carrying, uh, in fact, in, in their, or in their pockets, or in their bags, or, or in their night table. Um, and, uh, in fact, mi miracles started to happen, and that's how the people started to call it. Uh, the people in general uh, started to call it, call it Miraculous Medal. And the message is uh, today so relevant again, again, because we are uh, in, in some way uh, experiencing uh, similar situations at, that uh, were at that time in France, in, uh, around the world, uh, people uh, with uh, a plaque, uh, like we are experiencing today, uh, COVID, um, the people in distress, um, uh, wars uh, happening in different parts of the world, and uh, here you are, Mary, saying, I, 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 w I would like to help you. I am here to help you. Ask me for graces, uh, and you will receive uh, them. Ask my son for graces, and you will receive them. 
And is, this is the message that we would like to, to now encourage again or refresh uh, through this pilgrimage across uh, Italy. The pilgrimage officially began on November the 27th in Rome with a small procession on foot. It will continue by car from city to city across all of Italy. I was given this medal um, some time ago. I actually didn't know much about it. I just kept it. Um, and actually tonight, uh, when the priest was um, just in the mass, um, it was uh, explaining the history of the medal. I just got some new information, which I didn't know. Um, now um, that I know a little bit more, I probably can start building my own relationship with the medal. <laughs> morning I got news bad news uh, from a friend of mine he's um he's a doctor he works in the hospital um, he caught the virus and he's at home now in isolation um, the the first thing I uh, I sent him through whatsapp uh, was the icon of the of the medal and the prayer to be uh, to be said at um, five o'clock today I'm not saying that can solve your problems, but uh, because the problems are, I mean, are concrete, are real, uh, you can see it around you, but it can give you a breath of fresh air and maybe just, uh, uh, just a small little time that you can take for yourself to, to relief, just to, to say, okay, well, I'm here um, and I probably, were able to, to tell other people about this, about this experience. 190 years later, in similar circumstances of pandemic, the Virgin of the Miraculous Medal still continues to watch over all of humanity and comes as a pilgrim to visit and meet church communities scattered throughout Italy, thus fulfilling the promise of love contained in her message. I myself will always be with you. Have confidence. Do not be discouraged.